So to have daily bread is a simple thing, really. It means to have enough food to eat, to sustain your life and your health for each day. Somehow we complicate that, right? Our whole economy is built on the notion that you don't just need to buy bread for today, but you need 14 different kinds of bread and you should probably buy it in bulk and store it in a very large pantry, right? Give us this day our daily bread is a subversive prayer in a world of conspicuous consumption. I don't know about you, but whenever I come back from a trip, especially if I've been out of this country or if I've been out in nature for an extended period of time, I'm most disoriented in the grocery store, especially if it's a big supermarket. Because if you want fruit, you don't just have the choice of whatever fruit's in season. They've shipped fruit from all over the world so you can eat strawberries in December and apples in May. If you want crackers, like there's an entire aisle of crackers. After a week of camping, the amount of choices you find in a grocery store is overwhelming to me. We have so much before us that it becomes hard to appreciate the idea of daily bread. Have you experienced that overload? It's not just about food. It's the feeling I sometimes get when I turn on the TV only to turn it off 20 minutes later after scrolling through every conceivable show on Netflix and not finding something to watch because there's too many things to watch. I know I'm not the only one who's done that. It is the noise that comes at us from competing voices in the news. We have access to more news stories today than we've ever had before. In your pockets right now are access to so many stories you'd never have time to read them all. Yet somehow, we are less thoughtful and less knowledgeable about what is going on around us. Now, I'm not pining for the days when the world slowed down every night to listen to Walter Cronkite at the same hour, exactly. Misinformation did not begin with cable news, although it made it worse. But it does feel like some of our country's fracturing is related to having too much daily bread in a lot of ways. In seminary, I had the privilege of traveling in the Middle East for three weeks, and we traveled through Syria and Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, Palestine, Israel, Greece, Sidon, and Zarephath. Each day, I would be invited to sit at a table, either in a restaurant or in the hotel or in someone's home, and food would just magically appear on the table provided for me. I didn't have to order a meal off a menu for three solid weeks. It was just put before me every day. Some meals were fancy, most were simple, but it was all good, nutritious food, even if I wasn't sure what all of it was exactly. But I got used to the gift of not worrying about deciding what I was going to eat each day. And I recognized what a gift that daily bread was. It didn't magically appear from house elves, right? Someone had made plans to feed our entire group the whole time. People worked in kitchens preparing food that farmers had raised and harvested. It was a gift on that trip to be fed, to not have to worry about what I was going to eat each day so that I could be present for the gift of each day. So to pray for our daily bread is, to some degree, to acknowledge our dependence with each other. Because we live in a world of connection between us all, even if we try to pretend that we do it all by ourselves and our own bootstraps. For us to have daily bread, we need farmers to plant wheat, we need mills to grind the flour, we need bakers to knead the dough and watch it rise and bake it. We need trucks to deliver the bread to the market and people to ring us up at the cash register. We don't often notice the depth to which we are connected, to which we need each other. And we're in a global economy. Our connections to our food spans the globe. Our concerns do too. One of the things we've hopefully been reminded of since COVID appeared is that the well-being of people in other countries, in other states, in other neighborhoods is directly related to our own health and well-being. Give us this day our daily bread is a prayer we pray for the world. Jesus does not tell us to pray, give us this day for the next uh, bread for the next three years. We're not instructed to ask, give us this day more bread than our neighbor has. 
right? Give us this day what we need for this day. It's a prayer for enough, and enough is hard for us to ask for in a world that tells us there is never enough. Now, this may be the most Bay Area illustration that one could imagine for this part of the prayer, but did you catch the article in the paper last week about the Logier Meredith Vineyard in Napa? This was shared um, with me by Cornell Barnett, I'm not sure if he's here today, who's a retired minister who worships with us. And thank goodness for clergy who help other clergy with sermon illustrations. The week before, before, it's what's less helpful is after I've preached a sermon. He gave it to me an entire week in advance, which is remarkable. But in this story in the Chronicle last Sunday, the headline read, Napa's latest vineyard deal comes with a shocking price tag, zero. This couple was handing over control of their vineyard to one of their longtime employees who will make wine under a new labor, label. Sorry, They said, we could have cashed out. We know what it's worth, ballpark, but we also know we didn't need the money. They'd saved enough for retirement already. Give us this day our daily bread, indeed. Our Old Testament passage that Victor read takes place during a famine. There's a new king in Israel, his name's Ahab, and we're told in the previous chapter that Ahab is, has done more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than had all the kings of Israel before him, which is saying something because the kings of Israel were a very poorly behaved bunch of kings. Ahab is bad news. And he marries a woman who's even worse news. Jezebel, in addition to having the misfortune of having been named Jezebel, is also a foreigner. She's from Sidon in which, what today would be Lebanon. And she worships a false god. And she convinces Ahab to join her in her idolatry. So Elijah announces a drought in response to this evil king. But a drought affects both the innocent and the evil. And droughts disproportionately affect the poor who don't have the resources of the rich. I would like to suggest to Elijah that he could find a better way to prove his point about evil King Ahab. But even Elijah figured that out because by the time the drought takes hold, he doesn't have anything to eat either. So as our passage begins today, Elijah is sent to a widow from, the, from Sidon, the same place where Jezebel's from. And God tells Elijah that the widow has been commanded to care and feed for him. But our widow has not heard that command. When Elijah finds her gathering sticks, she says, Take care of you too. Huh, that's funny. If you were a better prophet, you'd know that I don't even have enough to feed myself and to keep my son alive. So I'm about to go make our final meal right now and we're going to die. And so Elijah tells her not to fear. And he tells her to go ahead with her plan, but he says, first make me a little cake of your meal and bring it to me. And afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord of God of Israel, this jar of meal will not be emptied until, and the jug of oil will not fail until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. The widow didn't hear the command the first time, but she hears it this time and she obeys. And this is why I think it matters that God sent Elijah to a foreign widow who had nothing, who was down to her last ounce of oil and her last crumbs of grain. Because it seems that it is only when we are at the end of what we have that we see how to rely instead on God. If God could have sent Elijah to a nice family in a Tel Aviv suburb, he could have lived in their guest room and waited out the drought and the comfort of their abundance. But the widow had barely just enough. So Elijah, so if Elijah and the widow and her son were going to make it through the drought, it was not going to be because of their own bootstrap pulling or because of their savvy investing or their wise planning or their stockpiling of future daily bread. They were only going to make it tomorrow because of God. Have you been in droughts like that? I have never known physical hunger or scarcity, clearly, but I have been a place where I just had enough to get me through the day. My faith may have been nurtured during my life of comfort and abundance, 
but my faith was forged during a time of emptiness. In a particularly difficult time in college, I remember going to bed every night exhausted and thinking, I just can't do it. I don't have the strength to face people tomorrow. I'm exhausted from doing it today. God, give me strength. And I'd go to bed empty, and I'd wake up the next morning with just enough to get me through that day. Just enough. I had no reserves, but the well never ran dry. And I was so thankful for that time of provision in my life. At each moment when I thought I would not make it through, someone would offer me the daily bread of kindness and grace. God's daily provision doesn't mean prosperity or guarantee a life of ease. Daily provision is the gift of enough. And I wonder what the widow from Zarephath was thinking as she took the last of her meal, scraping out the bottom of the jar with her spatula to get every last bit, and then taking her jug of oil and shaking the jug upside down the pot as it drip, drip, dripped the last bit out of the jug so she could mix it together and put her cake in the oven. She didn't have enough to sustain herself and her son, yet she trusted the word of Elijah's God, and she offered that small loaf to sustain her and her son and Elijah. What did it feel like to bake that last loaf before God had refilled the jar with flour and the jug with oil? Pray for daily bread is also a reminder to be present now, today, in this moment. Yes, obviously on some level we're all here right now, this moment. But it often seems that many of our hopes and dreams and energy get focused on tomorrow, which may never come. Today is the gift we've been given. As the Dave Matthews Band sings, the future is no place to place your better days. Planning for the future, of course, is not a bad exercise. We save for retirement and to put our kids through college. But if our future focus keeps us from spending time with the ones we love now, then we've forgotten the gift of daily bread. When we catch ourselves thinking, well, I don't have time to make it to the dance recital today, but next year I'll make it. Or, well, we're too busy now to go on a date, but when we retire, we'll have all kinds of time to travel. Or, we'll schedule a family portrait after I lose some weight. When the things that matter to us consistently get put in tomorrow's basket instead of today's, we have forgotten the gift of daily bread. Churches can do this too. I've known churches who've closed their doors and stopped their ministry, but who had millions in their endowments when they closed. Spending your endowment down to zero is also maybe not a recommended strategy, but think about how those churches could have turned things around if they saw their endowment as their daily bread, enough to get them through a challenge onto a new path. When you give to this church to support our mission and ministry, it is our daily bread. And while we try to plan in responsible ways, we also trust that God's provision, that your pledges will come in and that we will have what we need. For 168 years, we've been at work in this city, trusting in God's provision for us and working to provide that provision for others. Give us this day our daily bread as a reminder to trust and a call to our action. In times of booming stock markets, maybe it's easier not to worry about tomorrow, but when markets are falling, as they have been recently, the call to pray for daily bread remains the same. In good times and in the lean, we pray for daily bread. And when the future path seems clear, and when the path seems less clear, we pray for daily bread. There's a quote from E.L. Doctorow, the novelist, that I like about writing, but it works for this part of the prayer, too. He says, writing is like driving at night in the fog or in San Francisco in July. <laughs> you can only see as far as your headlights, but you can make the whole trip that way. So this week, as you pray, remember your daily bread 
and be present in the day that you've been given and be thankful for God's provision each day and be aware of our connections to one another. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Amen.